Uranium stocks are breaking out again, very similar to September of 2021 and March of this year, the big run. I'm going to go over what I think. And in this special episode, I'm going to be answering a lot of your questions in the comments and questions from Discord first. And then we're going to go over the market overall. I'm going to talk about the health of the market and where I think uranium is going. There's some news to cover. It's very exciting times. I think there's a lot of opportunity. So go ahead and please hit that like and subscribe button. We'll jump into this. So Really quickly, we're going to look at the uranium stocks, a little bit of the charts. Last video, I was talking about the symmetrical triangle breakout and how UEC has really stayed above and bounced off the trend line here. Now, we are starting to see that breakout. I think that the volume needs to go up a lot more for us to even get closer to this trend line on the top here. Now, I think that a lot of these stocks are very similar. We see Cameco as well. And they usually trade in packs. So it is looking very interesting. I like the fact that we're already back at the 420 mark. Now we saw a big run, almost what, 473 back in early June. Now the overall market, we'll talk about that later, but there has been a big rally the past month in the overall market. And uranium is just about $50 right now. So there are things that need to happen. I'm going to go into Denison Mines and their bid at UEX and what that means for UEC. That's going to be in a question later, but we'll first look over here at the market cap of Denison. It's close to a billion dollars and UEC is 1.2 billion. Now you can see on the chart here, this is since March of 2020. This is when everything started, when it all happened. You know, getting into uranium stocks back here was life-changing. And you can see that we're starting to take off again. Just a quick visual, a line chart. And, you know, we're not even near the high that we had yet in a lot of these stocks. We're still down a good amount. We're down on majority of these bigger stocks, 36 to possibly 50% in some of these developers down here. Now, when I say we are, I'm talking about the overall uranium sector. Now, myself, I have been day and swing trading uranium stocks. Now, I will be looking to establish long-term positions. I'll talk about that. There's a lot of questions. I get asked that every single day. But it is looking really nice right now. So one of the first things someone asked me recently was uranium and trending, when to buy and sell. Now, I can't tell you when to buy and sell, but we have seen people talking about uranium trending on Twitter, the hashtag. But if we want to look at uranium stocks in general, this is the history of uranium stocks, okay? It, since Google started tracking it in 2004. Now, we can see in 2006 and 2007 were the peaks. This is the peak of all time. Of course, people are searching uranium stocks because Paladin did 104,000% gain, yet it was not on Bloomberg every single day. Now, I don't remember seeing much about uranium, but as you can see, these times were the spikes and the peaks, and they're probably the best time to get in on the most volatility and then get out pretty quickly. The same thing. Fukushima, of course, people are going to be looking at uranium stocks. They were looking to short them. Now, if we look here, this was a prime time as well. The spike, the most pretty much we had seen uh, in a, almost a decade here, we can see in 2020, March 2020 into April. That was when I bought is March of 2020 uranium stocks. And you can see there was a spike in people searching on Google for uranium stocks. It was one of the biggest uh, that we had had up to that point in the last decade. And then we had another one, and look at that, last year, February. And what happened? Denison actually, during February, led the entire market for volume in that stock. We had like close to a billion share volume in Denison. I remember trading it back then. You know, that was a prime time probably to sell around that time, getting in a little bit beforehand. This is somewhat, in a sense, of a lagging indicator. I'm not saying anyone should buy or sell on this. But you can also see the other big one is September of 2021. This is when the most people were searching uranium stocks. You see the biggest runs in all the uranium stocks. We hit pretty much 10 year high plus for a lot of uranium stocks. Now we've since pulled back from those. So when was the last one? Well, this was in March into April of 2022. This was when I was buying and really buying heavily in day and swing trading in uranium stocks. And then I decided to sell when a lot of this pressure started going down. This was not the only thing, obviously, you know, I cover uranium 24 seven and there were a lot of other reasons why, but I sold all my long positions during this time into April. And that was when everything started to tank. And are we at this peak because you see uranium trending on Twitter? No way. You can see down here, it is at a 12 for uranium stocks and uranium stock is about a 23. Now, you know, this is still very low compared to 
the 75 or 69 that we had here. And obviously the peak was that 2000, March of 2006. That's when we saw the sprout prices really running. Now we're probably gonna see this go up very quickly if uranium stocks outperform the market which I think that they are going to, especially when uranium stocks start to run. Now, these are some of the questions people are posting on Discord. Now, hey, if I post your question on here and I commented, go ahead and comment below and I'll continue talking about it if you want me to elaborate more on it down below. Here's the first question. We've had a massive amounts of bullish news in the markets. The market was in a risk off mode and the stocks didn't move even a little bit. Will they stack and suddenly start to matter when risk is back on or was it perhaps a wasted catalyst? Now I said this was a while back, some people posted these. We've talked about it already in the Discord. I've really somewhat answered a lot of this. I know you guys ask the same questions. So with this, I think that Uranium overall is a long-term play. Now, I can play the day and swing trading aspects when we get catalysts, when we get volume and everything breaks out, but all these things are stacking up and we saw that just in the past you know, week, we've seen 20, 30% moves in majority of the uranium stocks. Uranium will explode, these stocks will explode on the upside when volume starts to come back into the markets. That's volume really is everything, okay? Do I stack precious metals is the next question. Uh, I do have some gold and silver. I like gold and silver, but to me, it's more of an insurance policy. I like to physically have it. Um, I don't like to trade any stocks in the gold sector anymore. That's really what I started out on. You know, penny stocks, especially in the mining sector, you know, 2006, 2007, when I first started trading the markets, that's what I traded. I only like to stack it just as an insurance policy. Do you expect to go long-term at any point or will you day trade most of the move? Well, like I said, this was a while back. I have bought some, especially for long-term, and I talk about that in the Discord a lot. So I do expect to go more long-term in the future. When that volume comes back, when I see uranium over a certain price and certain catalysts hit. So what was the main catalyst that mooned uranium in the 1970s? Yes, we had an oil crisis, inflation, global pressure, but what was a specific catalyst in that environment to set it ablaze? So I have a book here. This is the Great Uranium Cartel. So I study the markets. I study history, especially with uranium. And the big catalyst during this time was the U.S. was not importing uranium in the early 70s during that time. They were not importing anything. And they had a renaissance really in nuclear energy. Now, one of the main catalysts during that time for it to run was a lot of the big utilities they were contracting uranium and Westinghouse actually failed to deliver about 60 million pounds. And they failed to deliver because the price of uranium ran up hundreds and hundreds of percent in a short amount of time. And it overall went up 700%. And you know they were down billions and billions of dollars and it was because they were complacent. I think the same thing could happen, especially with companies that rely on this cheap Russian Kazakhstan uranium. I don't think it's going to be cheap much longer, especially with inflation. And it was complacency. We've seen the same thing. And we'll talk about it later. I think Cameco, as people have said, could have issues in the future if these spot prices run up like crazy and they stay elevated and inflation rises and it's hard for a lot of these companies to get projects up. It's going to cost money. But uh, obviously, I think the uranium prices will go up. So companies are likely to dilute shares You know, at those high prices. They will. That is one reason I like to swing trade uranium stocks too. Um, you know, I've really got lucky before where I bought and sold a uranium stock or a stock in general, and then they diluted the stock drops like crazy, even though the fundamentals, technicals, everything's perfect. The stocks are on the exchange so the companies can raise money. That's the only really reason why I guess you own a piece of the company when you have shares in the company, but they dilute, they dilute shareholders. And I think that's going to happen. That is the main catalyst. And so in today's environment, you ask what's, will it most likely be the catalyst now. I think that it's not just banning, but it's this nuclear energy renaissance in the US. And really, that was something recently because the main thesis for me, it really was an Eastern play for me. So it's the 160 plus reactors coming out of China and the East. And that's a massive demand. And the supply, the supply is going down. You know, we got overfeeding coming as well. So that's really what I think is going to happen. Will this Russian uranium ban, will the government's $4.3 billion investment in uranium help? Yes. But we saw the previous time we saw these supply disruptions were usually the biggest thing. So this Russian uranium ban could be one of the biggest because of the enrichment side of everything. And he said asking more to help everyone get a better idea of what news is fluff versus stuff. So I like that fluff versus stuff, Rob. 
But now the thing about this is, is a lot of news doesn't necessarily mean that the stock is going to react to it on that day. Now, mar markets usually are forward looking and we've seen this with uranium stocks. Sometimes they can move a lot faster before the price of uranium goes up. Now, a lot of news in the uranium sector, a lot of people could sell the news. That's, a, that's what happens a lot of time. Now, it's some news for the uranium sector. The stocks might be great long-term news. There's short-term you know, news and there's long-term news. Short-term news could be instantly the banning of Russian uranium or it passes the Senate and the stocks are eventually you know, going to jump up crazily, right? We could see massive volume come in, but they could sell down. But long-term, it could say that, hey, U.S. is going to invest $4.3 billion in you know, uranium enrichment. The stocks might go up less, but long term, it's really healthy for the market. How closely do you watch the technical charts? I've noticed, you know, this channel is heavily focused on the fundamental analysis and news flow. And finally, the last question, what technical analysis framework do you subscribe to? Elliott Wave, Price Action, RSI, etc. I'm very fundamentally based, but I use technicals all the time. When I'm in a stock, I always am looking at the technicals at the exact same time. So I think it's hand in hand. I think I like to compare that to a UFC fighter. The fundamentals are everything. They're, you know, your cardio, you know, have you been in a massive match where the stress is on, you know, have you fought enough fights? You know, that's what the market's like. That's what the fundamentals, you know, are like for a stock. I could also call it a stock MRI. I know everything about the company. I want to, you know, I look at the annual reports. I want to know every single detail. You know, I go through a checklist. Simultaneously, I'm looking at the technicals. As far as what I'm looking at the framework, but I only use about 10 charts. And I think that's really all that majority of people need. You know, there's so much out there. And if it was 100% perfect, you know, technicals, then everyone could follow it and you could trade and make millions. But, you know, I really think it's a 50-50 game most of the time with technicals and charts. And I think if you marry those two fundamentals, you could probably be right 60% of the time. That can be very profitable. So it has been for me and that's what I look at. Now, RSI, these type of things I really don't use specifically in every sector like uranium stocks. But I do obviously look at moving averages. Volume really is everything. It's the lifeblood of a stock. And what I found is the best stock traders of all time, traders and investors, they didn't really rely too much heavily on, say, Elliott Waves. Everyone's looking at that stuff. They Where they had the advantage is being able to look forward looking into where the company could grow. And, you know, not just that, is the company going to be able to promote? Because Munger really said that the best stock moves in the past, you know, three years were not because of great performance, because of great numbers necessarily. They're really because overall promotion. And, you know, so is the company going to be hitting on all cylinders? So that's what I look at. Uh, the 10 stock charts, I look at just a few of them, you know, the cup and handle, the, as I said, last video, the symmetrical triangle breakout that's happened. I've used this year, on like energy fields and UEC when I swing and day traded them did really well. I actually used falling wedge in a downtrend pattern. That was one of them that I found it, and I saw the breakouts and was able to see that. And uh, I look at uh, I look at the minute. I look at the second. Sometimes it's it's just it can really you know change based on each stock. But one of the big things I like to look at too, I think a lot of people fail to do this, is I want to know every single stock in that specific sector. And I will see what the leaders are doing. And sometimes that that really does help, knowing what all the stocks are doing. And you sometimes can see some of the bigger stocks move first, you know, and then some of the smaller stocks, maybe the less liquid stocks, they'll catch up later. So if you're day trading, swing trading, those are the things that, some of the things I look at, but there's a lot more to it. What price will you start permanently unloading shares for the longer run? So if you hold any of this way at all, instead of just swing trading, when do you think the finale will be time-wise? And will you roll profits into explorers for the mania phase this Wall Street bet mania phase when the end of the cycle is in sight. So I've talked about this, you know, I've been saying that I think that there will be a mania phase, you know, right at the peak, you know, that's usually when everyone starts to get in. Uh, myself, I've been very, very blessed to find stocks at their bottom. A lot of stocks, a lot of sectors, you know, GameStop, AMC, you know, and I was able to spot these things very early. Uh, Rite Aid, a lot of these stocks uh, had massive short positions. Some of them, 
you know, we're from the same, you know, obviously company shorting it. Uranium sector as well. There was a lot of bearish people on uranium. I don't think we're close, not even close to that mania phase yet. I think uranium is going to be a long-term bull market, you know, and I think the finale really, I, these are improbabilities. I don't know the future. I don't know what's exactly going to happen, but in probabilities, we're going to be really needing uranium, especially by 2025, 2026. These long-term contracts, there's no doubt that they're going to start by then. 700 million pounds. I think that we're going to see, you know, small modular reactors are going to be a big part of the future. 160 reactors coming from China. So late 2026, I think that we could have some massive moves if we don't have them, you know, sooner. I've seen, I've traded stocks, so SPI in 2020, that stock ran 4,000% in a day. And this was a, you know, this wasn't like a penny stock or anything. Went from like a dollar to $40. I watched it pre-market. I was going to jump in, but I was just too scared. I was too scared. But the thing was, is that that really had a mania run 4,000% in a day. The biggest thing I could say is when you see supply, these are cyclical markets in uranium, right? When you see the supply come up and, and outweigh the demand, that's when I want to be out of the trade. There will be a time, I think, when I'm not going to talk about uranium anymore, you know, not going to trade it anymore. And, you know, I won't have any long-term positions anymore. And that'll probably be at the end of the decade. This is when mines like Arrow, you know, deposit from next gen are coming up, you know, and if we see any disaster possibly, but even with the disaster, you usually it's longer term that we see this because obviously they still need these long-term contracts to fill up. So I think after that's all done, that's really how the cyclical market works. Next question. Do you think LEU will dip? So that's Centris Energy will dip to present a better buying opportunity, possibly on a bad Q2 earnings or a ban on Russian uranium. So I initially owned Centris Energy LEU at about $4. So I saw this thing go up to 88 bucks. I sold out. Now I think that there will be possible, you know, good buying opportunities. I have swing traded this stock a lot, you know, in the past couple of years. This year I did as well. On a Russian uranium ban, it is very probable that this stock drops. I had said this back when we first had the war start and we were in the almost 40 bucks around that time, right? 30, high 30s. And it dropped to 17, right? So that's a massive drop. And that's without even the ban on Russian uranium. Now, Citrus Energy does get their a lot of their enrichment, their LEU from France as well. Now, what's great about the company is Centris Energy, there's a lot going on with Halu, a lot of government support, 700 million. And one thing about the company is it's it's really going to hold a monopoly if they can get this Halu in production. And they do have amazing contracts in place with, say, France for LEU at 2018, the lowest prices ever. So as the prices are going higher, they can make a ton of money. And they have billion dollar book out to like 2026. I think it's going to present a great opportunity. In my opinion, I probably will look at it. So these are just some of the ones, like I said, a lot of these are already answered in the Discord. Now, the ones on YouTube, I've got a bunch on YouTube. I've got a bunch here on Twitter as well. So I've never done this, so it's kind of fun. Sometimes I've already answered them sometimes. All right, so one of the first questions, uh, Derek, if you could only invest in one uranium company on the ASX, what would it be and why? I can't tell anyone what they should buy. Now, what I do think I can say this, what I, what management I think is probably one of the best, and I've said it before, is Deep Yellow. I really like the fact that John Borshoff right now, pretty cheap, especially the stock is very cheap. You know, they got Vimy, Vimy Resources, and I've been covering this for a couple of years. Now, I said that John Borshoff would start to do these M&As very quickly when he thought that the uranium bull market was starting, and he has, which is great. It's a leading indicator, you know, in my opinion. They're doing this a lot sooner. They made the mistake, John Borshoff made the mistake with Paladin last time. Getting into contracting at the peak of the uranium bull market, unfortunately, and they also started you know, putting out billion dollar offers for like Summit and all these things, they really kind of got screwed on that at the peak, paid way too much. It's best to obviously pay a lot less when the prices are low. And that's something that stocks like UEC have been able to be doing with Uranium One assets and possibly UEX. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The Denison, uh, Derek, are you following 92 Energy and Baseload Energy Drill Program? that borders each other, any thoughts on their drill results and future prospects. So if you, if I answered your question, go ahead and comment below and we'll keep the thread going. I'll answer them physically inside there as well. 92 Energy, I do like the CEO. I think it's great to have a female CEO as well. Baseload Energy, 
they're great management as well. It's the first thing I look at. They've obviously, he's found the aero deposit, next gens. Baseload's had some really good, you know, results. Now up there, obviously, the, the grades are a lot higher up in the Athabasca Basin versus Africa. Their drill results, prospects, really right now, I don't want to put too much thought into any explorers right now. Now, I think that it's very probable you see smaller market cap uranium stocks run. And I think that because they've had these pretty good results, they've had you know some really high grades found. And because their market caps are still very low, there is good upside. But um, in my opinion, I think producers, ones with permits, that's really where it's at. They're going to see some big moves, I think, in my opinion. So what do you make of the low float for new scale and its sideways movement? Like I said, this was two weeks ago. It's a SPAC and a SPAC in a recession, it's going to it's going to be rough, right? So it's had a pretty good movement, uh, new scale. Now, in my opinion, I've been covering this stock. Remember, I, I covered this stock back when way below back here before the stock was even trading on SMR. I was talking about the company. The thing is, it's done, it's done about a 40% move very quickly. I don't think this is probably going to hold because remember this this company, they're they're not going to be making massive amounts of money just yet. It's it is a real future speculative play. And if we are in a recession, uh, SPACs, they can get hit very hard. And there is a lot of competition. Think of it like this: there's 50 to 100, you know, SMRs look looking to come out there. Yes, they've got, you know, the permitting and and there are, you know, things in place. The volume obviously has came in there. We've had some good buying volume. But I think that this could sell down. It's very probable it sells down, you know, and, and it has traded along with the market. The overall NASDAQ, it's done, what, an 18% move or so, you know, in the past month, about 18%, close to. So, you know, these these stocks in, say, the small modular reactor space, they're going to get, you know, people viewing it. It's a million volume on at $14. I still think it needs to get a lot more volume to be safe. A lot of long-term investors, I think, need to come in. It's still in a speculative phase. And there's a lot of competition, 50 to 100, you know, reactors out there. And you have, say you have one issue with a meltdown or something, that stock's going to tank. And are the U.S. producer stocks going to tank? No, they're not going to tank, a lot more than likely, because they're going to still need that long-term contracting. But they're not necessarily going to need to permit a small modular reactor. We we hope they do because these are going to be safer, better, but it really could hold things up. The government does not always make the best decisions. Okay. Have you thought about doing a quick review of vanadium? Sometimes the co-mineralized with uranium also on the critical minerals list, multiple uses and suffering a vast growing supply deficit as well. All right. So vanadium, I've covered it in the past, you know, in a recession, vanadium, you know, steel, it is somewhat used less. It will probably go up somewhat with the overall commodity, critical minerals, you know, as, as time goes on with inflation. But really, uh, I think uranium is where it's at. It's it's a lot easier to get vanadium in a sense. A lot of it is out there. I think uranium really is where it's at because you got to process that to make that fuel and it takes multiple years. Next, have you looked at alligator resources on the ASX? They seem to be doing good things and have very good management. And also, what are the chances we are all wrong and uranium is suppressed and manipulated somehow? It just feels like it's never going to pop higher. <laughs> like I said, this is, uh, we started getting that pop just recently, two weeks ago. So I have actually invested in alligator energy resources back in like 2020, when I was more speculative in investing in say, explorers. In my opinion, you know, because I don't, I don't really like to buy stocks really on the ASX anymore. Compared to the dollar, we could see a drop there. It's also just, I don't like the way the ASX trades. Now, is this company going to do well? It is probable, you know, we see this. Now, as far as the suppression, like, I think that, I don't think really that uranium is being manipulated. It's just a, such an opaque market, such a small sector. And, uh, you know, the overall market has pulled lots of stuff down, but uranium is looking very strong. We're near $50. Uranium stocks are starting to take off again. So you can see uranium's popped many times and uh, it's usually during this fuel cycling. So by fall time, we're probably going to see a good move, very probable. And I think by the 50s, it could break out. 
Our sanction exemptions positive for centrists might ease 10x uncertainty, in my opinion. Sanction exemptions are probable for centrists. I have talked about that. Uh, so Dan, their CEO, he was uh, Secretary of Energy for the Obama administration. He has big connections in Washington. He was a corporate lawyer in Washington, D.C. I mean, he knows everyone, of course. Um, he probably could call anyone up. I'm sure he knows a lot of people in the House and Senate as well. And it is probable that they get exemptions. Now, Is if this ban happens, you know, Russia is probably going to retaliate. They We've seen them do this. Uh, we've seen them in 2018 say that they are not going to export any material prop possibly, not just enrichment, but any nuclear related materials because of the sanctions in 2018. So it's probable we see that. With the understanding that no one truly knows, can you talk about your thoughts on when capitulation will end? Simply said, when will we unyoke? Have we already? What factors do you think play into this? So I've I've pretty much been able to answer this many times the past couple of weeks because it's been a couple of weeks since in the Discord. I've wrote you know, so many hundreds of thousands of posts on just the overall market, uranium especially. And with this, I think that capitulation has, in, in the last couple months, we've had major capitulation. I think it's uh, the overall market capitulation, if we're talking about that, I think that we're getting closer. I think that uranium needs to still get into the 70s before we can unyoke from the overall market. But seeing the 18 plus percent move in the NASDAQ in the past month, we'll look at that. If you want to see here, actually, the stock chart, the heat map, this is the past month. This is every stock in the sector. Amazon's up 26%. So we're not unyoked yet. I mean, this is really one of the reasons why we've seen uranium stocks do pretty well. You know, just recently, we're starting to see somewhat health in the market, a dead cap bounce possibly. But when you see massive stocks, trillion dollar market caps up 25%, you know, $250 billion plus market cap added in less than a month. You know, even stocks like Microsoft, Google, they're, they're still positive in the past month. I think that we're not there yet. You know, Tesla, 29%. We're not there yet. We're not unyoked. I think that we, we need some of these catalysts to come in. We need long-term prices. These long-term contracting come in. Long-term and short-term spot prices need to go up a little bit higher. I think then we could probably unyoke. I think it's very probable that we have a lot more capitulation, especially in uranium, because I think that we're going to hit new highs and then we're going to pull back again. And that's why I've been day and swing trading and doing very well on it. Can you please make a detailed video on how you day and swing trade uranium stocks? Are you trading stock options? And what are some of your strategies that have been working? So yes, I do day and swing trade uranium stocks. It is what I love doing. I've made a great amount of profits on that. This is not to brag. I've made six figures sometimes in a month. And when we had those massive volumes in March, April, that was, you know, really, really good compared to the overall market. Some of the strategies I've used constantly plugged into the market. I spend way too much time probably doing this. I overthink things sometimes, but it has helped. I look at everything out there in the markets. I look at every uranium stock. I look at the charts. I look at them simultaneously. I look at the volume. I look at the overall market because we've been yoked to it, you know, on sometimes the, you know, 30 second chart. So if you see here in my discord, actually, this is a real big helper for me because there are certain channels, all this stuff in here, I'll have automatic bots be able to post stuff from all around the web instantly. It's kind of like my Bloomberg terminal. And it's very, very nice to be able to keep, to be updated with not just Uranium, but the overall sector 24 seven. And some of these channels, well, majority of these channels, I get automatic updates. We have some amazing people in here. A lot of people are off right now, the weekend, but we have some amazing traders. This really does help for when I, you know, buy a day swing trade. But really the, the best thing out there is to, to really research history. That's something that I have done, research history in the markets, the stocks you're looking at. I look at annual reports. I go and read those. I, like I said, I want to know everything about the stock. Um, my stock sheet, when, I, when I'm tracking the sector, I want to know everything about these companies. All of this stuff I keep track of 24-7. Uh, this is a new one, 2006 versus today. If you look in there, that is a big tab I rely on now. Comparing them, you can compare all of the uranium stocks now to the previous 
you know, how much money they had, how many pounds they have, what was their market cap? Because a lot of people get confused. There's going to be probably hundreds of uranium stocks coming up. So keeping track of them really helps me. I have an exit strategy. I put in here what what I do is a long term on the long term side and short term, just so much. Uh, you know, on a day and swing trade, you know, the loss chart here, this is just something simple, but just know like if a stock's pulled back 80%, like we've seen some uranium stocks do, there's a 400% upside back just to break even. Day and swing trading, you gotta remember this. You know, there's some uranium stocks that have pulled back up in the 90% range before, okay? You know, and, and there's massive upside and they outbeat, you know, this break even price in the long run. So there's massive amounts of opportunity out there. And I think the best opportunity for me right now is to day and swing trade. So if you guys want to day and swing trade, I do that pretty much every single day I'm, I'm plugged in the market. So link in the description below for my Discord. And that's really uh, the way I do it. Now, I, I'll probably make some videos later on, especially in my Discord. It's easier to do on how I day and swing trade. Like, what do I do? How do I look like? What do I what charts do I look at? But in the day and swing trading section of the Discord, I post, you know, my charts of the stock, why I'm buying and selling it when I do it instantly. And, you know, it's pretty plain and simple. Some people will try to make things harder than they really are. You buy a stock and it either goes up or it goes down. The stock could go to zero. It is probable, but I don't like to buy stocks, especially in a market like this that will go to zero. Uh, I like to buy stocks that have no debt, are, you know, permitted, especially for uranium, have pounds that have good management. I look at uh, the float side, the volume. I look and see, because not every stock trades the same. I look at the overall sector. I look at the stocks in those sectors and see how they traded on news catalysts and how they traded when certain things happen. And you got to keep a note of all this stuff. There's so much to it. But uh, the more you do it, I think the other thing is you got to be pulled away from money, okay? So like you can't trade on emotions. You can't, you know... You can't even invest with emotions, really. You don't want to invest with emotions because especially in uranium, you know, if you want to be a long-term, you know, profitable investor, then you can't really be in the emotion side. And I, you know, sometimes will get rid of a stock instantly if it does the opposite of what I thought it was going to do. Or if I see news or, or things that I don't like about the sector, you know, saying uranium and it has helped. The next, do you expect any announcements from the DOE next week at the conference? So the DOE, the Tiger team, um, you know, at this this conference in Washington, along with the heads of the DOE at this last uranium ban, they are announcing, you know, 700 million for Halu. We've kind of talked about that. So they are very pro uranium, pro U.S. enrichment, and they are supporting somewhat, but they want to wean off. This is what they said. They want to wean off Russian uranium, but that might not happen. It might be a total cutoff. With spot prices coming up this week, how encouraged are you with share price resilience? So right now, I think that the spot price, I think the uranium stocks are starting to run a little bit faster than the spot prices have. You know, we're at 40, what, 49.25 on the ask. Um, I think that, you know, it is encouraging that we're starting to see this move with the uranium prices before the spot prices run up like crazy. I would like to see a bigger peak Especially if you look at the charts, if uranium is, you know, pulled back each time on this base and we break out in the 55 range, I want to see uranium stocks like UEC break out to new highs. And I've seen some analysts say that they are expecting at, say, 100 bucks, UEC could be $12 US. Um, I think it is probable stocks like this could see multiple, multiple billion dollar market caps. You know, UEC at $200 with their just 5 million pounds of uranium It'll be worth a billion dollars just through uranium. And this is physical uranium, so it's not like pounds on the ground. So uh, I think it's possible for these U.S. producers to have multiple billion dollar market caps, energy fields, UEC, and we could see a you know a big move, you know, in the multiple double digits very soon, especially for this this stock. If we see a hundred dollar plus uranium move, next can LTBR Lightbridge begin production this year as shown in their official roadmap. They're more of a fuel fabricator type move, type play, still a speculative play in the you know nuclear side. I consider this like a, an explorer that really hasn't found much uranium. Um, but the stock does the stock does somewhat move 
with the overall sector. It does move with, uh, especially like LEU when, when that moves. But at the beginning of the month, we've seen a move 63%. We dropped down to 17 bucks and this stock, boom, is up 93% since that. Um, is it going to be able to get back to these prices? I think before it gets here, we're going to have to see some confirmation from the government, something happening with the war. Something's got to change. Next, the large majority of the investing population related to nuclear energy with nuclear bombs. How will this affect uranium with continued global tensions? Will uranium producers ever embark on a meaningful and aggressive marketing campaign of their product to gain awareness in global energy markets? So I think people are starting to really wake up. We've had Elon Musk. We have you know, a lot of big prominent people uh, you know, Robert Downey Jr. talking about how they are supportive of nuclear energy. Now, this doesn't mean the global, the overall globe, but if we're really looking at the population, the big populative areas, we're seeing the big, biggest cities as well, say in Japan or say even China, they are very pro-nuclear. They're going to have 160 reactors. So it really doesn't matter what the West thinks. The West could get left behind if we don't, if we don't catch up this uranium, this uranium renaissance, the East is going to really lead the way. But I think the West has a big opportunity to become the dominant player again in uranium enrichment. And, you know, we obviously have the most reactors up, but I think we could have hundreds of reactors, small modular reactors, possibly. People looking at nuclear energy and nuclear bombs, that's just one piece of it. It's also medical isotopes. We we see a lot of positive things that save people's lives, right? For U.S. producers, uranium producers to spend money to change the way people think about uranium, it's not worth it. That's my job as a filmmaker to do. More than likely, we've seen it get a lot of publicity. They did a documentary, obviously, on the on Netflix on the meltdowns, Three Mile Island, or when they talked about how you know clean energy really isn't clean energy, how nuclear is really clean energy, but things like EVs, they're you know they still use these rare earths windmills, all these things, they harm the environment in, in a certain way. So it's just really, it's it's a never ending battle. And I don't think that the producers should ever spend any money on that. I think that it is the job of, you know, people with larger platforms. Eventually a country will see that when they're like Japan shut off all these reactors. Now they're supporting it. The people are like, turn them back on, you know, bring them back up because they don't like being hot in record temperatures. They don't like not being able to use their TVs. Next, can you name your top three industries that you're watching or better yet, think are going to turn around this year? My example, I see an opportunity. So cannabis has been beaten down as low as it can go. And when one should buy, two is uranium and natural gas. And three is copper is becoming more attractive. Out of all the metals, this will seriously be needed. I totally agree on all three of those. It's kind of funny. You might be in our Discord, right? Uh, I don't notice the name, but uh, yeah, those are those are literally the three. Um, I've traded cannabis back, what was it, 2017 or 2018? I day and swing traded a bunch of it. Copper as well. Uh, I think, you know, because of EVs is going to be a big one. But uranium, uranium should be my attention. I will look at other sectors, but, you know, if I'm day and swing trading, if I have a million, $2 million buying power for that day, in that account, I'm going to use it probably on uranium stocks. If we're getting this massive volume, we're getting record amounts of volume coming in. Really, there's no other better opportunity, in my opinion, than uranium. But those sectors are very, you know, I, I like the fundamental analysis on those. You know, the government, you know, say cannabis, the government approving things federally, trying to trade multiple industries at a time. Um, now, if uranium doesn't never takes off, then obviously I'll probably sw day and swing trade a lot of those industries. But it would be like having a relationship with someone trying to marry more than one person. It's going to be rough. Now, if that's your thing, that's your thing. But it is very rough. If you want to dedicate a lot to something, then you probably, I would rather be an expert in just one or two things than to try to, you know, become an expert in every single, you know, sector. But knocking those three down, I think, those do have pretty good upside. Next, it's pretty obvious how manipulated precious metals are in oil. And could uranium also be vulnerable to any kinds of market manipulation? Now, uranium, I don't think can be manipulated like oil. We saw negative oil. Uh, we've never seen negative uranium. In fact, 
in the seventies when oil only did what a, you know, three X uranium did a seven X. So the great uranium cartel, uranium has been manipulated. This book talks about it. Uranium was somewhat manipulated, but in 1973, when they tried to manipulate uranium, it failed because that's when we had the embargo happen, a recession and the uranium cartels, that's who tried to manipulate it, were found out and uh, they got screwed. And the prices of uranium ran away from them, ran a lot higher. They were trying to manipulate it and they couldn't. And really it's because uranium is hard to manipulate because all the uranium out there is all accounted for and it's all physical uranium, the fuel. It's all stored and it takes multiple years to make. It's nothing like, it's not as not as easy as say gold or silver, the way it can be manipulated. It doesn't trade in fiat type systems. It is physical uranium. When Sprott Physical Uranium Trust buys uranium, they are actually buying physical uranium that exists. Their names are slapped on the barrels after they buy them. So I don't think it's going to be manipulated as easy. Could it be manipulated in the future to the upside? I think it's very probable. Next, take a look at the ratio of URA divided by spot and see where the next rally could take us. Before another pullback, when will we ha go parabolic and when will you go from trading or to investing long-term uranium stocks? That's like the number one question I get asked. When I'm, when I'm going to go long-term. In this type of market, obviously with a recession, on the brinks. Even if I'm long-term in a stock, I never marry a stock. That's one of my trading principles. Don't marry a stock. I could be in and out of a stock that I've even been long-term for years. I could be out instantly. So that's why it is important for me to be plugged into the market. If I wanna look at spot, the spot price, I don't think that I can tell when the next rally is going to be by just looking at URA and divide it by the spot price. If if that was the case, then everyone could time the, the tops and bottoms in this. And that's just not the case. I think that, you know, my best indicators are this contracting coming up. We see catalysts in uranium. We see volume, volume, seeing the volume come back. We see the catalyst. If there is a Russian uranium ban, it's just one added caveat to it. But it really is the Eastern plate. It really is these the demand coming in. And it's really going to be, um, you know, if we're talking about the spot market, when this next rally, I think uranium stocks are going to run before we get to the, you know, seventy dollar range. I think they're going to be that's their next leg up. But if we get over seventy to hundred bucks, I think they're going to move pretty quickly. But there are so many things to to look at it, and I really can't even get into it in this video. It's already long. What when I think the next big run is going to be? A lot of stuff I've actually put in the Discord with lots of research, like you just asked. So go check it out in the Discord. If I'm holding UEX, will those eventually turn into UEC? How does it work, and when is there going to be a buyout? Up in the air right now. Well, I guess we'll talk about it in this with Denison. So Denison did make an offer. They did the same thing to UEX when they UEX was looking to get the JCU assets, and did they upbid? Obviously, these these uh, Canadian companies. They're looking out for themselves because if UEC has to pay more, it makes their assets that Denison has worth more. Denison probably wants them, but in my opinion, Denison does not trade very well. And this is not a hating, me hating on the stock and the company. I just don't like the way it trades. We look, we saw record volume in the market last February and we are still not over $2. Heck, we're, we were down below a dollar. I don't like the way it trades. I think they're gonna have a hard time getting all the assets up. They're gonna be burning cash like crazy. UEC has tons of cash. They've They've got the upper hand in this. And what I've said is I think UEC should not even do uh, another offer. I think they should just collect the $8 million that they'll get from UEX for going, say, with Denison. We're in a recession and a developer, these developers are going to have issues coming up way higher prices than they anticipated the last decade. But if they do go with it, obviously... UEX has ran a bunch recently. Those shares will transfer into UEC shares. We got we got to see how this goes. And the ratio, who knows if the offer goes up, the ratio is going to change. But usually the market has a good, you know, pricing on where the stock will be. And the stocks ran up like crazy because they think probably UEC is going to bid. But I don't think, I think UEC should take the money and they should concentrate on the projects they got. These Uranium One assets, the, the amazing assets they got and uh, the permitting they already have and get into production and buy physical uranium. You know, maybe even buy 10 million pounds worth, you know, they've already got 5 million, hold 10 million because then it'll be worth 2 billion at $200. So, you know, that's going to help them in their contracting too. Yeah, UEX management has, people have said that the management has failed. So maybe it's a positive thing. 
UEC actually ran after this and Denison went down. Next is Penn worth holding. Peninsula Energy. I can't tell you if it's worth holding. Now, if we look at Peninsula Energy, I mean, the market cap is very undervalued. They've got, they've already contracted some long-term contracting. They've got, you know, they can get into production pretty fast, obviously. You know, the float, having close, you know, a billion shares, that's holding it back. Not having this New York Stock Exchange listing. And really, you know, it could profit in the, during this bull run. And it could have investors come in. You know, it could grow very quickly. So it is on my radar. I know a lot about the company. I like the management. I do like the management. I think that a lot of smart people, you know, Wayne Healy, but do I just buy a stock because management? No, I buy a stock if it trades well. And this stock has unfortunately not traded very well. We had a pretty big run that pulled back. I'll go into just mentions on Twitter. I didn't even ask people to ask me questions for this video on Twitter. These are just how many questions I get all the time from people. My inbox is flooded to... I can't tell you what to buy. Remember, this is just my opinions, right? If both UEC and Denison want UEX assets, then does Cameco and Arano just watch? And are they not both in partnership deals with UEX? Are they not going to be kicking themselves a year from now for not buying UEX themselves? Here's the deal. These companies have way too many assets probably anyways. A lot of them, they're just sitting there. Pounds on the ground does not always equate to profits. Sometimes these are big risks and liabilities. And uh, a lot of these assets are probably not going to get up during this uranium bull market. Cameco did not do very well. I think that they should have been buying up these assets in March of 2020. But Cameco, if they want to buy something, they're probably going to have too much of a problem buying it. Also balance out the risk. They already have assets that they're going to be able to get into production and sell very quickly. Usually you see bigger companies, bigger market cap companies like that, buy at the total wrong times at the peak of the market. And, um, you know, so they can just up those pounds in the ground and try to get their market caps higher. Anything substantial accomplished towards a Russian uranium ban or more of the usual BS. I kind of made a video on this already. You can go check it out on that Russian uranium ban, but we'll probably know something this week. Uh, there is a recess coming up, a big one. So they're going to try to pass this massive bill for, that's going to be obviously helping out uranium, this inflation bill that they're wanting to call it. That's going to call, I call it the inflation bill because it's going to cause inflation. You're going to see prices go up. It's a lot of money. We'll probably see something maybe pretty soon on a, a release from the committees. This is a big one I get asked all the time. Can you make a list of uranium companies and rank them one to 10 and one being the best? Can you also make a list of how much uranium they have and the cost of the mine? I've shown a lot of people this. A lot of these down here, I have a tier ranking sheet, all the uranium stocks, exit strategy, everything. I already have a list. So if you guys want that, link in the description below. It's, it's on my Patreon. I put a lot of work into that and it constantly changes all the time. I also have a uh, down here, caution uranium stocks because we're going to see hundreds of uranium stocks. I already put a bunch in there that are coming up from the other sectors, you know, gold, silver, that are pretending to be uranium stocks that aren't even close to uranium. And it's going to fool a lot of people, but it's not going to fool you guys having that. So this question, I posted that UEC, Uranium Energy Corp, was URME on the OTC last uranium bull market. This is interesting. I've never really talked to you guys about this, but the peak market cap, and this is all in that stock sheet, but the peak market cap of UEC was only 411 million at $9.35. And it was 44 million share peak at that time and had 25 million pounds of uranium. That's uranium in the ground. That's pretty much nothing. And only 15 million cash. Now, currently, the market cap's over a billion. This was a few days ago, so obviously it's higher. The shares right now are 286 million shares. 300 million pounds plus 5 million, that 5 million in inventory. That's if they get the JCU assets. They still have hundreds of millions of pounds compared to, you know, the 25 million back then. And they have 186 million cash. So it is a far better company. And it traded on the OTC back then. It was OTC BB, if you know what I mean, back in the day. That's what those were. That's what we traded. Now, the stock also had only like 40,000 volume, 40 to 60,000 volume. Now we're getting, you know, eight, 10 million at way higher prices. And uh, I think that because people say, is it a better investment now versus then? Well, if you look at all the numbers, everything's better now. Just the overall market's better now than in 2007. But it is interesting to look at this because people will look at the charts and say, oh, it was $9.35. But no, the market cap peak was only 411 million. And they had no pounds, no cash, no volume. It was on the OTC. 
Now we have the New York Stock Exchange listing here. Now that's enough questions for the day. If you have any more questions or if I commented on your question, please comment below so I know that you're watching the channel if I answered your question or if you not specifically asked that question, but if you were wanting to know that, comment below. And I'll try to answer questions physically this time in the comments. Right now, we're looking at the overall you know, energy sector, the energy commodities. We saw a big run in gas. We saw oil start to run again. And I think that we're going to see a very big run. Uranium is going to take the lead, I think, very, very soon. Very probable. This was an interesting article. China has a nuclear power lead and should sell to the developed world. Policy research says... China does have 19 reactors under construction, 43 awaiting permitting, and 166 announced. Now, they are far cheaper in kilowatt hours versus, say, the U.S. If we look at Georgia, I think Georgia, it's 1,000 kilowatts, like $10,000. I think it's close to $1,900 for the same thing for nuclear in China. And they also can get these up a lot faster, four to six years. They've got 19 reactors under construction, 43 awaiting permitting, and 166 an ounce. But this is interesting, you know, can China replace Russia, their tech, you know? I think China is, it is very nice to see, you know, these new reactors come out. The future, I think, is really small modular reactors. It's going to be. There's 50 to 100 different types out there. It's gonna be very competitive for those stocks, but they're gonna need fuel, they're gonna need Halu. So this week, it is probable that we see a lot of volume come into uranium stocks because they are getting a little more publicity still looking very good. I think that symmetrical triangle breaking out, you know, it was great. Almost exactly where I said it would. Look at that. Right off, right off the trend line almost. And it was right when I said that that symmetrical triangle was forming. And now we have these catalysts. If you guys like this video, please comment below, comment your new questions. And uh, if you guys want access to all the sheets, all the data that I have in my discord, there is a link in the description below. 